Kia ora everybody. Welcome to UC Arts here in at the Arts Centre, home of the Classics Department and of course to the Tees Museum of Classical Antiquities, which I do hope you will take the time uh, to look at after this talk, if you have not done so already, and even if you have, going back through a, a second or third time, you will spot things that you missed the first time, and it's well worth repeating. As Naomi indicated, my name is Gary Morrison. I am the Roman historian here at UC, and one of my chief research interests happens to be looking at night in antiquity. In particular, what people in the ancient world did at night. And one of the questions I ask, of course, is what was actually going on? What did people really do? Now, I'm sure we can all come up with a few answers to that particular question, but we have to keep in mind that this is a family-friendly hour. <laughs> and tonight, what I want to do is explore some of those issues for you and with you. So for the next 30 odd minutes, I want to build on the themes of night and navigation that are at the centre of the Arts Centre's night market. And I want to transport ourselves back a couple of thousand years to the night in the urban areas during the early Roman Empire. Specifically, I want to ask how did the ancient Romans navigate through their urban areas at night? And in doing so, I want to actually explore what was going on in those urban areas at night. So what sort of activities can we, can we expect to, to, to see? And one particular thing that I'll come back to quite a few times in this, in this talk is street lighting. So was there any form of lighting, and what form of lighting could have existed within the urban areas of Rome? To address these questions, I have to begin with the day. And I want to introduce some of the realities of what it was like to live in an ancient Roman city. In particular, what were the urban areas of the Roman Empire like? How did Rome's inhabitants live? What can we say about these cities and their lifestyle? So I want to build that particular picture first. And I'm beginning here to give you a feel of what it was like. I can't go through all the details, we simply don't have enough time. But I want to give you that feel for what it was like to live in a city or a town of the Roman Empire and I want you to take that overview that I, that I began with at the start of this, this talk. And I want you to keep it in mind as we then move into the nighttime period and, and consider what it was actually like to live in, in, that, live in these cities during the nighttime. So we will begin with, with the urban areas of Rome generally, and then we will move in to looking at what was going on at night. Now to start off, I've got a question for all of you. Who here has actually been to Rome? spent time looking around Rome. Great. So about half of you have spent a good amount of time, hopefully, in Rome. And while you were there, undoubtedly, one would hope, you spent time walking around the Forum. And that's what we have on this particular slide, the ancient Forum in Rome. And going to the Forum, of course, you wouldn't have been able to miss the Colosseum. We have an image of that there on the left. And on the right, we've got the Circus Maximus. And hopefully you spend some time looking at that. It's not a, there's not a lot left of the Circus Maximus, uh, but you might well have seen it either from the Palatine Hill when you're up on the Imperial Palaces, perhaps looking down, or as part of a tour group or a tour bus driving past it. It is an important site and a, and a rather spectacular site. Now, from these side, slides and while you were actually at Rome, I think it would have been reasonably easy for you to try to reconstruct these structures in your mind. <coughs> the grandeur of the, the buildings, what they could have actually looked like. And perhaps here we're helped a little bit too by Hollywood. But the result, regardless, is an image of Rome that tends to be based on magnificent temples, magnificent buildings and structures. The large, the large big structures like the Colosseum that tend to dominate our viewpoint. And I want to continue that theme just in the next few series of slides. And I'll begin here with a model of central Rome, which takes this, this idea just another stage further. So this is a model, as I indicated, of central Rome. We can clearly identify, or I hope we can, the Colosseum. We can see the reconstruction there. Probably also the Circus Maximus down here in the bottom left. It's that, it's that, that, uh, it's that structure, that, or the, the empty field that we, that we saw. And between, between the Colosseum and, and the Circus Maximus, we can see a large aqueduct coming through, and that feeds in, at the end of the aqueduct, is feeding into the Forum area. So it's a reconstruction here of Rome. Once again, the impression is large, impressive buildings, order, 
and a very clean, well-organised, functioning city. That's the view that we tend to have. And if we jump from a reconstruction based on a model to a reconstruction based in 3D uh, online, this is a part of the forum. And notice again how the representation assumes gleaming marble, order and cleanliness. Notice too how there are no people milling around, messing up this particular scene. This is the way we tend to imagine ancient Rome. The same is with this view of the Circus Maximus. This reconstruction is a long way from the site as it stands today and as we saw earlier. The focus in this image is the scale. We're impressed by the structure and the type of civilization that we think would create such structures. What we can't and don't tend to factor in are the numbers of people that would have <coughs> attended events here and the chaos that lots of different people would actually bring to the scene. The reality is that people used to queue through the nights to get seats here for major events. But the representations we tend to see emphasise once again grandness and order. Even when we take the focus away from these large structures and we go into a street scene and a reconstruction of a street scene, just like we can see in the slide here, the reconstruction still emphasises what we have come to expect from the grandness of the public buildings. This slide shows us a city with no rubbish. The buildings are all in good repair, and again, no one is on the streets. There is also a sense of space with wide, uncrowded streets and pavements. To be fair, some of the reconstructions that we get do include people. <laughs> but even when this is done, the scene, I would suggest, remains far from realistic. The streets, as we have them, as we can see them in this particular slide, show no evidence or real evidence of daily life. The streets here are so clean that they almost gleam. As you might have worked out, I want to suggest that the reality was a little different than these slides present. Rome was a crowded city. Its population dominated by slaves and the poor. There were peoples from all around the empire who had descended on the city to seek fortune and favour or have been brought in in chains and sold to the highest bidder. It's difficult to put an exact figure on the population, but the figures that we do get in the ancient sources suggest that in the time of Augustus and that of the early emperors, so the first century CE, the population of Rome numbered in excess of a million people. This is a huge city. To give you some context, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the next European city that hit that target was London, and it did so at the beginning of the 19th century. So we're talking about a city that had a massive population. It had existed a couple of thousand years ago. So we have over a million people living in, small, in a small space. The majority of these inhabitants were poor, struggling to survive. They did not live in those vast villas that we see in the movies, or the villas that we marvel at as we look around Pompeii. And again, I've just got a couple of quick slides for you to reinforce this point. Here is a, a slide of uh, the House of the Fawn, a huge villa in Pompeii, for those of you that have actually been there, or those of you that intend to go there. Uh, it stretches across an entire block. It's famous, here's the one, this is the villa that they found the Alexander Mosaic. It's a famous, huge villa, and this is a reconstruction of one of the many rooms. These are luxurious houses, and they were for the privileged few, and I mean the very few. The vast majority of Romans lived far more modestly. Some lived on the streets, some in shantytown-type structures around public buildings. Others actually found shelter in cemeteries in the vast tombs that were found there. If they were lucky enough, to have had a job or at least worked for a day or two during the week, they might actually rent a room. And that room could be in one of these villas, one of the villas that gets subdivided, divided up like some of the flats around, around Christchurch or, or other cities. So that occurred. But most would have lived in a room in an overcrowded, high-rise apartment building. To accommodate its residents, Rome was a city that built up. Cicero, 1st century 
DC politician famously describes it as a city built in the air. Now we can't see these apartment buildings in Rome, Rome today that is, but we can get an indication of what this may have been like from Ostia, an old, the old port town of Rome. And um, if I can give you one tourist trip, tip, sorry, for your next trip to Rome or your first trip to Rome, I do recommend that you try to get out to Ostia if the ancient world interests you. It is a site that is off the tourist map, but it has a lot of buildings, just like Pompeii, streets and, and the like. The, at the most, you'll probably run into a school group or two that's going around the site. It's well worth a visit. You can get to it by a suburban train from Rome. Um, so here, if we take a look at this particular slide, what we can see as we look down the street is the remains of a multi-storey building. This is the slide obviously on the left. So I've taken the photo <coughs> and just looking down the street and looking at this building. The bottom, the bottom opening would have incorporated two floors and there would have been shops and uh, possibly bars and the like, commercial activity occurring more than likely in most of that bottom floor area. Then you move up to the, to the uh, upper storey window that in effect is the third story, and there is a floor above that, and you can get onto that floor, which is the start of the fourth story. And the photo of the, on the, the right, I took looking back down the street to where I took the first photo. So I'm up on the fourth floor at that particular point. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind that there would have been more floors above this, at least another floor or two, probably made in some form of lightweight construction, um, wood more than likely. And our next slide shows an actual reconstruction of an apartment building in Ostia. Not the one that we were looking at, it's a little bit further down the road, this reconstruction. But again, notice the height. And that reconstruction, I would actually probably add, within that, within that roof space, there would have been more rooms than living space. So this is what we're dealing with. And to reinforce this point, the height of the buildings that we have in Rome, I should also emphasise that we know of legislation that tries to restrict the building height, restrict it to 20 metres. The attempt to impose a height limit was actually made several times during the first century CE by various emperors as they tried to control the building within Rome. So in other words, what we have are buildings that were going up in excess of 20 metres, and the emperor is trying to impose that 20 metre height limit on several occasions. So we have a lot of very high buildings in Rome itself. Now, the point of this lengthy preamble, and there is a point, <laughs> is to begin to give you a picture of living in Rome. And to stress that when you think about urban Rome, to take your mind away from those grand buildings that we started off with, the, with the, in this talk. And away from the wide spaces that we see in movies. Instead, imagine narrow streets, framed on either side by high-rise apartment blocks, often with shops or bars on the ground floor. And again, this is a street from Ostia, and it's quite easy, I think, to do if you can imagine those buildings going up on either side, what it could be like, what it could have been like. And when we move to this next and final reconstruction, we can perhaps begin to see a little bit more of what it could have been like to live in Rome. What we have here are narrower streets and higher buildings. Notice the shade that begins to appear in this particular slide in that street itself. There also would have been awnings and balconies that would have protruded from these buildings and they aren't there in this reconstruction. These were made of wood and they simply haven't survived, but their presence would have added more shade to those streets. Narrow alleyways in particular would have been dark. And let's not forget that Rome had lots of alleys and lots of winding streets. It is built on hills, making flat straight roads the exception in this particular city. The slide also shows or gives us an indication of tall buildings, many of them in need of repair. Our ancient sources write of building collapses and cracks hidden by landlords as they try to rent them out for exorbitant prices people living in the city, we have, sorry, we also have people, live, people in this scene that show that they're actually living there. 
that they're part of the environment. You can almost get a sense of community. And this is what life in Rome would have been like. You would have had lots of communities around different streets and different areas. Although, in this particular reconstruction, once again, there is nowhere near enough residents. Remember, Rome was crowded. It was packed. The crowds and the difficulty in moving through Rome is evident in many ways. It comes through all the time within our source material. But one thing, one way in particular is worth, worth mentioning very briefly, and that's through a law that was passed in around the middle of the first century BCE, which actually restricted all non-state business traffic in Rome to the end of the day or into the night. So you could bring a cart or a wagon into the city if you were helping out with a festival or trying to build a new temple, but you couldn't bring a cart or a wagon into the city if you were resupplying a shop or some other local business. That had to be done in the evening. What this did is twofold. It actually pushed the resupply of shops and taverns and the like either onto porters and slaves, who would then carry the produce through the streets of Rome and therefore increase the crowds in the streets. It did reduce the daytime use of, of carts and wagons, of course, but it did also increase, increase their use at night and some commercial operations would therefore use the night to bring in the produce and products that they needed. And this is a point further emphasised by the complaints that we have about the noise at night in urban areas and the difficulties in which the Romans had in actually sleeping. With such a large number of people, imagine too the rubbish, the dirt, the amount of human waste that had to be managed. Yes, it's true that Rome and some other urban areas in the empire did have sewage systems, drains on the streets that fed down to them and took the water overflowing from fountains with presumably some of the dirt and some of the waste. But many toilets were not connected to this system. Chamber pots and cesspits were far more common. Now think again of those single rooms that we mentioned earlier where people would actually rent out and live. They would actually be the home not for one or two people but usually for a family. There was no toilet in them. They had chamber pots that they used. And if they were lucky, the floor that they were on might have had a toilet at the end of it. Often they didn't. And they'd have to troop downstairs to the bottom floor where there may have been one and they could empty their waste. Don't want to do that from the top floor. Most just hurled it over the balcony or out the window. <laughs> Either the contents or the whole chamber pot. And this is a point that Juvenal makes, and we'll see that very shortly as we delve into what was actually going on at night very, very soon. It's doubtful then that the streets were pristine. Far from it. I believe that they were a mess, <coughs> especially in the back, back streets and the alleyways away from the main thoroughfares. Now the resulting picture is, I suggest, a long way from the vast marble street scenes in the movies. Certainly some areas were looked after more than others, areas frequented perhaps by the emperor and the elite, but the bulk of the city would, have been a, would not have been a pleasant place to be. And this is a daytime scene. <coughs> Let's now move to the night. Consider how these streets, especially the side streets and alleyways, would have taken on a different dimension at night. Based on this reconstruction, and on moonless nights especially, moving through the streets must have been considerably difficult and probably rather dangerous. This happens to be the view that is given to us by Juvenal, first century CE satirist who lived in Rome. Juvenal presents nighttime Rome as a very dangerous place. If we look at part of one of his most famous satires and what happens to be one of our most descriptive passages on the night, we can see that Juvenal writes, there are other nocturnal perils of various sorts which you should consider. It's a long way up to the rooftops, and a falling tile can brain you, not to mention all those cracked or leaky pots that people toss out through windows. Look at the way they smash, the weight of them, the damage they do to the pavement. You'll be thought most improvident, a catastrophe happy fool if you don't make your will before venturing out to dinner. dinner. Each open casement along your route at night may prove a death trap, so pray and hope for you that the local housewives drop nothing worse on your head than a pail full of slops. 
Juvenal goes on to note that being hit by a flying chamber pot, and we've got an image of one there for you, being hit by one of those or its contents is actually only one of the many dangers a Roman may face at night. From a drunken bully out looking for a fight to a wealthy aristocrat and a retinue of soldiers to guard him and slaves holding torches to light their way. Even young hothead's juvenile suggests keep their distance from such a group. In terms of a general description then, what we have in this account, even allowing for juvenile's exaggeration for effect, is a setting where burglars and thugs prowl. The dangers, it seems, are everywhere. The overcrowding and poverty that we have already noted would have fueled desperation. Remembering, too, that Romans needed, in the first instance, to look after themselves. A police force, as we understand the term, was not a reality in ancient Rome. Juvenal's description fits with the, with the crowded city full of desperate people that we have spent time constructing. I would think that for the dead of night, the early hours of the morning when most are actually as finally asleep, that Rome probably is as, da as dangerous as Juvenal suggests. But I want to also stress that this is not the full picture. And just like any city or any society, things are a little bit more complex. Juvenal's description emphasises darkness and danger. But it is not a scene devoid of activity. And if we focus on that time as night actually begins to fall, we could find even more people around. Their presence, the activities that each undertook would, and actually did, change the street scene yet again. One of the scenes from this time that we may all be familiar with is, of course, the aristocratic dinner party, where the wealthy, elite Romans ate and drank and partied together. These events actually began not at night, but in the late afternoon. But as alcohol was involved, many, of course, would have gone on well into the evening. In fact, we know that they did. Accounts of the Emperor and Nero's banquet, banquets have them starting as early as noon and going on until midnight. In Juvenal's description of the night, he alludes to these dinner parties and the lateness of the hour with reference to the retinue making their way home. This is the aristocrat that has his bodyguards and slaves lighting their way with torches. Now, slaves with torches is particularly interesting, at least in the context of how Roman streets were navigated at night. The need for slaves holding torches would suggest that there was no light available, and so torches had to supply the light in which the aristocrat made his way home. Sounds reasonable. I, however, think that this observation is not quite the full picture. There, there is, in other words, more going on. In short, the need for light to be supplied by the aristocrat's entourage was not simply about lighting his way. Obviously, torches and lanterns did provide the light when needed, but they also signalled his presence. Light demonstrate that demonstrated that this was a significant body of people moving through the streets and that they should be left alone. It advertises status and power, two key attributes within the Roman world. I don't think Juvenal's description is solely about the need to light a roof. If I am right, then I'm also saying that some Roman streets, or at least parts of Roman streets, may have been lit. While I don't believe that Rome had bright street lighting, nor that every street or even all of any particular street had lights, I do believe that the Roman Empire's urban areas had a vibrant nightlight. And as we shall see, to make that nightlife happen, artificial lighting is needed and is a reality. To demonstrate what I mean, let's look first at a couple of anecdotes that show us that Rome could actually be lit up at night and that events did take place in the evening, at least on occasion. Now on this slide, I've actually got a couple of short quotes for you. The first describes how in the first century BCE, our politician that we alluded to before, Cicero, having prevented some conspirators seizing control of Rome, turns around and heads home. For those of you that know a little bit of Roman history, we're after the Catiline conspiracy here, so where Cicero has basically saved Rome, in inverted commas, and is the hero of the hour, and he is now heading, wrong, heading home. Sorry. Our author, the biographer Plutarch, then writes, It was now evening, 
and Cicero went up through the streets to his house. The streets were brightly lighted, since people had put lamps and torches in their doorways. The woman also showed lights from the roofs of their houses in his honour. The second anecdote tells of emperors and some shows and spectacles that they put on. And again, a biographer, this time Suetonius, tells us that the emperor Caligula put on theatrical shows at night and in doing so illuminated the whole city. And that the emperor Domitian lights up the Colosseum with torches in order to put on gladiatorial shows. Now these are only two examples of the sort of things that the emperors did. They would put on festivities and shows at night that would emphasise their power and enable them to build a connection with the populace. So it was part of, part of their way of cementing their position and showing how important they were and what they could do for the, the ordinary people of Rome. But they are showing that they could light up the city, or at least part of the city, when they needed to in order for, for these shows to actually take place. And that's the important point. And even with Cicero's example, they could light up the city, or Cicero, there was a way for everyday people to light up the streets, putting lamps and torches outside their doorways in order for the streets to, to, to come alive in the night when, uh, when, it, when, when there was an event or an occasion happening. Now, what though, what about, these are, these are obviously one-off events. Now, they actually happen quite often, but they are still just one-off events, and they can, they're anecdotes that refer to, to particular occasions. What everyday activities might have necessitated this, this sort of provision of light, or at least some provision of light at night? In the urban, in the urban centres in the Roman Empire, we find numerous bars, taverns and the like that everyday inhabitants of towns frequented, and did so quite often. Avianus Marcellinus, a 4th century historian, goes as far to actually suggest that the poor would spend their entire night in the bars, drinking away their sorrows. It is, of course, from these establishments too, that juveniles' hotheads would emerge, tanked up, looking for trouble. The following series of slides show examples of the bars and restaurants that we have, and that can be found first of all in Ostia, and then in Pompeii. So I just want to quickly <coughs> look at what we're actually talking about here, and then we'll go on and discuss how they could have operated and how it affected things at night. So this is a slide that shows a, a bar, a tavern in, in Ostia. It's actually right opposite that apartment building that I showed you earlier. So uh, it's right across the road, we have, this is a street scene looking in at that bar. Here I'm standing in it, looking back, and you can begin to get a sense of the size of it. It's quite a large establishment. Back right, there's also an outdoor courtyard area. Behind me, there are actually toilets and some services as well. And standing in the same spot, looking across towards the counter, uh, where you'd get served your, your alcohol and also, also your food uh, as well. And we're looking back out onto the street from that particular spot too. And of course, anyone that's been to Pompeii will also know that there are many, many such establishments all around Pompeii. They vary in sizes and they're all over the city. Here we have another quite large establishment from Pompeii. This is actually across the road from the bathing complex. I'll come back and talk about that again briefly in a minute. Uh, and we have the inside here of another tavern too uh, within Pompeii. Now without doubt, these taverns and bars were an escape for many. They were places for fun, they were places for gambling, they were places for sex. The paintings from the walls of bars in Pompeii show us what was likely going on during a Roman evening out. I can't show you all of them, but I can show you some of the sort of things that were going on uh, within these particular evenings or these nights out. We can see in this slide, gambling. We have on the left a group of men at a table playing a dice game. On the right, the small image is actually of a fresco of two men playing dice. Now there's actually another panel that's meant to be next to that, but it's really, really badly damaged and it doesn't show up well in a slide, so I've left it off. But the cartoon type, type uh, scene below it is actually both of these, these particular frescoes sketched out with the Latin translated into colloquial English for you. So essentially it's another dice game that's going on in this particular tavern. Um, and a disagreement over the rolling of the dice and a fight erupting and the bartender throwing them out of the bar. 
some things don't change over 7,000 years. And again, another fresco that shows other things going on. In a bar, here we have a couple, a man and a woman sharing a kiss, and then a couple of men calling out to a waitress with their order. Of course, the customers of these establishments tend to be the wage workers of Rome, relaxing after a hard day's labour, losing with the barmaids and enjoying the drink, company and games that they could find in these pubs. And if these labourers did not feel like going to their local bar, then there were all sorts of other activities and distractions in which they could and better get engage in the evening. So it wasn't just going out to a tavern for a meal and a drink, there were all sorts of other things that they could actually do in the evening as well. Some bars, first of all, were actually open into the evening and enjoyed by a wide cross-section of Roman society. Everyone went to the bars, from the poor to the wealthy. They all went. Here, I have given you an actual reconstruction. It's a model of Trajan bars at Rome. I've given you the reconstruction just so that you can note the size, which helps reflect the popularity of these, of these places as a leisure centre, and also the bar's importance to the Romans. This was a place that they all went to to enjoy the company and, and interaction uh, with one another. Here, again, for those of you that have been to Pompeii or plan on going, we have the stadium bars. It's got a plan on the left, uh, and the photo that is taken uh, on the right, that photo was actually taken from a, a position just outside area T on that plan, looking across area S, the exercise area, uh, towards that top right-hand corner. And that top, top right, right-hand corner, just for those of you that are actually interested, that's the, the woman's bathing area in that top right-hand corner, and then the sort of lighty green, yellow section, M, L, and K, and J, that's the men's bathing area down on the right. Um, so they had these, 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 uh, these bathing complexes, and we know that some bathing complexes were actually open in the evening. A contract for managing a bathing complex in modern-day Portugal, Portugal actually specifies that the bars needed to be open into the evening for the first two hours to allow those coming off shift work out of the mines to go to the bars to enjoy so after their work. Many bars and taverns and food outlets were also co-located in and around bathing complexes, clearly catering for customers going to and from. So we've got the taverns, the restaurants, the bars. We've also got large bathing complexes that were open into the evening for people to go and enjoy, enjoy themselves and to actually relax. And of course, if we are discussing Roman nightlife, then I have to make some mention of brothels and sex. And here we have the famous brothel from Pompeii on your left, and on your right, the only family friendly fresco of what was on the side. <laughs> Prostitution was legal in ancient Rome, sex was readily available. The graffiti and frescoes from Pompeii alone makes this abundantly clear. You would find prostitutes in the bars, the taverns, and in the brothels. Also on the streets, occupying cemeteries with the elaborate tombs provided some shelter as well. Now the impression from this description and this description of nightlife is, I hope, that there was actually a lot happening in ancient Rome and the other urban centres around the empire. The bars, baths and brothels would have been escaped from what was a hard life and the arduous living conditions. Remember the cramped rooms that were actually the homes of many. So this was their way of being able to actually live. You couldn't really live in those sort of rooms. <coughs> to facilitate these nocturnal activities, it's reasonable to expect that some light was both needed and used. Lamps and torches would light the bars and baths, with some undoubtedly spilling out onto the street. And that's a point to which we'll return. For now, what I want to emphasise is, is that this vibrant nightlife is not focused on by the writers of the time as our authors tended to be the elite in society. And they looked down on this crowd, the everyday people that would go to the local bar and actually enjoy themselves. This was not how you were meant to live. A good night out for the elite involved spending the evening at a friend's dinner party, making their way home with guards, and when they got home, they locked themselves safely away. Guards and dogs would actually ensure their safety. This at least is where the elite were meant to be, and what they were meant to be doing. We know that some of them were actually drawn to the festivity of the urban nightlife. 
the danger and thrill of the bars is actually where they want it to be as well. And here, I've got a slide that shows you that this desire went all the way to the emperor. Though biographer Suetonius tells us how Nero would disguise himself and then visit the bars and wander the dark streets of Rome looking for trouble. He and his mates would beat up citizens found out and about and even break into shops to steal items that he, Nero, would actually then auction off. We're told that Nero got badly hurt on one of his escapades and from then on, he'd actually disguise his bodyguard and they'd accompany him, interfering in brawls if Nero was at risk or if he signalled him to come and attack to help him out. What actually happened was uh, Nero was out and about at one of his little escapades. He was disguised and he went into a bar and he was hitting on the senator's wife. And the senator took exception to that and pummeled him nearly to death. So after that, he thought it was a good idea to keep his bodyguard at close, close quarters to, to help so, him. So the senator recognised him as next opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> might well, might well. We also know, though, that Nero was not alone in enjoying Rome's urban nightscape. Ammianus Marcellinus informs us that a third century emperor, Gallienus, would actually disguise himself too to wander the, street, the urban streets of Rome at night, while Gallius Caesar did the same in Antioch in the middle of the fourth century CE. That's an important one that we'll come back to very shortly. The draw of the crowd, the nocturnal activities clearly held an appeal, in spite of the moralising tradition so evident in their extent literature. And it's here that I want to swing our focus back onto those events and onto street life. We know from our earlier description on spectacular events that systems existed that enabled the streets to be lit. It's also clear from our investigation of, of urban nightlife that people were out on the streets at night and the activities that they took part on took part in, sorry, required lights. The bars, the taverns, the bathing complexes needed light to operate, and not all of that light would be internal. To entice customers in, one would think some lanterns would be hung outside, not necessarily providing a lot of light, but enough to let anyone know that a bar or a shop is actually open for business and you're welcome to come in. We do have a couple of anecdotes that actually reinforce this very point. First is made by the Christian author Tertullian and refers to brothels. He notes that the marker of a brothel was actually reeds and lamps hanging outside by the doorway. The external lamps signalled the establishment was open, and of course, it would also have cast a little light out into the street. The second anecdote is from a discussion by a jurist, a legal writer or lawyer in antiquity. What apparently had transpired was that a shopkeeper had gone out to put his lantern down on the pavement at night. We can speculate that he was perhaps closing his shop, perhaps removing it from where he had hung it outside, uh, and in the process of doing this, a thief swoops in and actually steals the lantern. The shopkeeper gives chase, ends up knocking his eye out, and the discussion's all about the consequences of this. The violence that occurs, of course, echoes that which we have seen juvenile indicates was the norm, and the lantern perhaps indicates that shops open at night, again with the light on to attempt to attract customers in. Both of these anecdotes suggest that some lighting was falling onto the street a fact supported by the huge quantities of lamps that have survived from antiquity. There are literally thousands of them, lots of different shapes and different sizes. They were used to light up the bars, the shops and the bars were light, both internally and externally. Not necessarily providing bright light onto the street, the cost to do that might have been prohibitive, but they did provide some light. In fact, for those of you that have been around again, that have been into Pompeii or into some of these bathing you might notice that a lot of them are actually quite dark, even during the day. Lamps and lights were used during the day as well as in the evening inside. So the actual extra cost of running a couple of lamps outside would have been minimal and uh, in the overall scheme, scheme, scheme of running the actual bar and would have, of course, advertised that this bar, this bar was open and you're welcome to come in. Reports on the archaeological records that we have by excavators of Pompeii in the 19th and, and early 20th century actually reinforce this very point. One excavator uses lamp finds to suggest that lighting existed in select commercial areas and select streets in Pompeii. 
Unfortunately, the archaeological records from this time are so bad that we don't actually know where objects were found in Pompeii or from what structure they are connected. So in other words, we don't know where lamps were actually found, and therefore the theory itself is actually quite difficult to substantiate. All we can say is that the quantity of lamps found means that it is possible, and I would argue that the anecdotes that we have discussed tonight make the scenario probable. It is reasonable that some street lighting probably occurred in some parts of Rome's urban areas, even if only for a limited time during the night. We may actually find an answer to this question in the new excavations that are going on in Pompeii at the moment. Some of you might have seen the reports on TV of the horse that was found, um, and the new row of villas that are being excavated from part of Pompeii that hasn't been excavated before. I'm hopeful that on the exterior of those villas, villas they will find places where people would have hung lamps and lights to help facilitate uh, people being able to travel along the street. Time will tell. There's one further point that I'd like to make about street lighting in antiquity. At time, it seems that the lighting of streets became a more common occurrence. Earlier I mentioned how several emperors used the, light, the cover of darkness and poor lighting to actually mingle in the bars and taverns after dark. One of these emperors lived in the 4th century CE and spent time in Antioch. The map there is to show you reinforced where Antioch is. The historian Ammianus Marcellinus remarks, that he would try to find out what everyday people thought of the emperor during these nighttime excursions. But he was foiled in his endeavour because the street lighting in Antioch was so good. And I've included part of Ammianus' comment in the slide to read it. This he did boldly in a city, i.e. Antioch, where the brightness of the lights at night commonly equals the resplendence of day. We can conclude that in the 4th century, a major urban area in the empire had some street lighting that was apparently of a good standard. If this was the case in Antioch, then surely we could expect to see similar developments elsewhere, especially in some of the other key cities in the empire. I would suggest that what we actually have is the evolution of the haphazard lighting evident from that early, early empire period. Over time, more and more commercial operations co-located to provide what customers wanted and needed. Through this process, clusters of street lights appear to facilitate business and activity. As this becomes more common, the scene in Antioch evolves. Street lighting becomes part of a Roman urban area. In summary then, we can conclude that while the streets in Rome were undoubtedly dangerous at night, they also held an appeal. When darkness fell, residents did not just retire to wait for the next day. There was too much happening, with bars, bars and shops and brothels open into the evening. These commercial activities provided light for their customers and lit up part of the street, even if dimly. These pockets of activity would have been like islands in the night. This in turn means that navigating the streets would have been difficult, but some streets, or at least some sections of streets, would have been lit up even if only for the first part of the evening. As the evening wore on, many enterprises would close, and so the islands became fewer and further apart. The dangers that Juvenal wrote about would become the reality, and navigating the streets at this time, the dead at night, would become far more dangerous and difficult. And I think I'd better end our look at Rome's urban streets and nocturnal life here. I hope you've enjoyed our brief journey through ancient Rome, and I am more than happy to take a couple of questions if people have any. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't have to ask anything. You're welcome to go through just the museum. But if anyone does have a question or two, yep. I have a question. Um, you said that Rome had about a million people. Mm -hmm. At that time, <laughs> The, uh, when you go through Rome, you've, yeah. you've been to Rome, you've got the walls, the wall that the, when you come out of the, the railway street station, yeah. you've got that camera there. Mm -hmm. um, that marks the official premium of, or the boundary, if you like, of the city of Rome for quite some period of time during the Republic. It did spawn past that to 
especially with the tunes and the like yeah. that went beyond it. But we're not going a long, a long way beyond. So it was quite, it was quite compact. I've, I struggled to actually get an exact area size, but we are talking about a compact area, and it was, it was built up heavily, with a lot of people living in those high-rise buildings and living in, in shanty town type structures that would have also sprawled out, especially through the, the cemeteries and the like that went out from Rome. Mm-hmm. A lot of people living in those. So it was, it was, it was tight. Find in, um, but it, and it went up. Right. Yeah. What were the um, circles in the top of the clock? That looked like. Oh, okay. They, um, that's where you you'd actually have food that was in there. So there might be soup, stew if it was if it was heated. You'd also have uh, wine that could be served out of there as well. So that was that was serving. You'd have serving ladles and you'd scoop out some some soup or some stew or something along that that you you would pour some some wine and that would come out as well. So yeah that's that's what they were used for. Anybody else? How did they use the lighting? Uh, the the lamp, so there was that slide that was back before we got the lamps and you had oil in those lamps. Mm -hmm. So um, you just pour oil into the into the the large part and then light the end and it would just burn. yeah, the, I mean, they had various forms of, um, they didn't have safety matches, obviously, they were using either light heads or the light, but yeah, they were folks and strikes that they could. And they kept fires going, which is also part of the problem, because the hassle of actually relighting it could become, uh, could become problematic. And so when you had those small rooms that you actually lived in, you, you might keep a fire going for quite some time. Provides a little bit of light in the room, you cook with it, you heat with it, and of course, it's very easy for something to catch fire, and then that spreads. Imagine those cramped conditions, those high-rise buildings that we saw in that reconstruction. It had a few um, awnings and balconies made of wood, and the fire can very easily spread very, very, very quickly. And, and that happened more than just Nero's fire. We've probably all heard about. There were a lot of fires that swept through parts of Rome. Anything else? No. Good. Well, thanks very much for coming. I do hope you enjoyed it. I do take advantage of the viewing the collection if you haven't done so already. And um, we have several of these talks that, that occur occasionally, so do keep your eye out for them, and we'll hope to see you back here again.